any train. It's time to head on over to the train station. Well, we are pretty excited to have you here. Our 1 million subscriber puppy training special. Um, who would have ever thought that we would be in this situation? Certainly not me. No, you did think that we would, which is why you've pushed so much to work towards this. Well, I mean... This was a goal. It is a goal, but, you know, you just can't envision when you actually reach that goal. True. You know? so it, it, was a pretty believe, it was a pretty hefty goal. Especially considering <laughs> Kale and I went to a conference five or six years ago, and, and we were there, and we had 3,000 subscribers or something like that, and a yep. good friend of ours who uh, we've actually... Uh, done some collaborative stuff. Um, had forty eight thousand subscribers. And we I, were in awe of I, him. I was like, Joe, that's incredible! I can't believe you have so many subscribers. <laughs> we want to have that many. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. But for today's show, it's all about you. We want to thank you guys for joining us here in the train station. We want to thank you guys for hitting that subscribe button. Huge thank you to uh, a couple of our members. I see Tanya Roxborough re up. She's been a hey, heart, heart dog supporter for more than a year. I see uh, awesome. Yin Tu Yang. Welcome to the Hard Dog Supporting. Um, we're excited to have you guys here. You'll see their names are green in the chat. Today is a bit of an open forum. You know, we just want to have yeah. a conversation about just where you are with your training. Crazy. Yeah. Usually we have a really structured training plan, mm. teaching plan. And, um, you know, it is, uh, it's a little bit more formal. So, uh, oh, you know what? I need to call this certain very specific person out here. Oh. Wait till, wait till I get it in the queue. Okay. Might be a moment. Actually, I might need to do some computer changes. SD Cruiser. Wow. One of our one of our initial uh, yeah. moderators. What do you call them? Like alumni? <laughs> yeah, he would be an alum, I yeah, guess. Yeah, thank SD you. SD Cruiser, it's been a long time. Um, so when we were streaming to 30 we, people, you yeah. know, 20, 20 people, SD Cruiser was in the chat talking about dog training, helping us out. Yeah. He's currently training his uh, doodles, I think. Um, but helped us out a bunch early on. So we huge thank you to you and welcome back uh, to McCann Dogs, SD Cruiser. It's been a while since we've seen you. That's really cool. Um, I need to do a couple of adjustments on the computer for a second, Kale, if you can just take yep. the show for a minute. I absolutely can. Um, so tonight we thought we would talk a little bit about uh, puppy training and answer some of your puppy training questions, whether it would be about potty training, house training, um, what things you should focus on when you first get them home, um, problem solving things, um, anything puppy related and I always say this on every stream that we talk about puppies if you're in the chat and you have a dog that is not a puppy so they're like I don't know seven months and older um, it's not uncommon for people to have hold older dogs that have similar problems to, um, to to puppies so don't go anywhere if you have an older dog uh, seven months is really <laughs> not very old uh, but you may you may still find um, you know some information very valuable um, depending on what comes comes up tonight um, <coughs> with that said something we love to do something uh, I hope you enjoy because we do it every single episode but in tonight's show it's the 1 million subscriber special answering your puppy training questions I'm excited to get started I'm Ken Steep I'm Kale McCann welcome back to McCann Dogs So maybe this is your first time here. You know, maybe you've never joined the train station and maybe you've watched a couple of our videos and now you're like, well, who are these two people? Uh, my name's Ken Steep. This is Kale McCann. We're professional dog trainers at McCann Dogs. And at McCann Dogs, in our training facility, we've helped more than 100,000 dog owners to overcome the same dog training challenges that you have. So uh, our train stations, where we get to dive a little deeper, we get to look at some of the, the nuts and bolts of training, the stuff that you really, it's so funny, you know, people are always looking for like a solution to the problems. Like, oh, now I, my dog's jumping up, now I need to do this. Well, better dog training is to have a plan because if you fail the plan, then you plan to fail. And if you can set your dog up to be successful, your training's going to be better. Your dog's not going to learn that some of those nuisance behaviors feel good. So, uh, you know, we really want to make sure that you get the best information. And this is especially important for those of you who are puppy owners. Now, drop yes in the chat if you if you are a puppy owner and, and you know what actually add your dog's age too so yep you know yes yeah. and then you know in months you know one month whatever uh, however old your puppy is let us know and uh gives us a sense of what sort of how to like uh, cater Where some to of take this information it. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but we are here tonight to answer your questions so uh, I'm excited to uh, to uh, get get into this now something that we love to do in every single show is 
find out where you're joining us from because mm-hmm. <laughs> we have uh, excuse me online training students from 58 countries now yeah we're push, well, pushing 60 almost yeah. 60 so 59 countries we're super pumped to meet people from all over the world it's really exciting and personally for me i think it's so cool to like research some of these places where we get to see our online students from we get to uh chat with you guys here in the train station so where are you joining the train station from i'd love to know just let us know maybe your town city something like that it's also part of my romper room moment uh and we it's fun have for me. a very wide variety of ages which just great. makes it more fun okay yeah that's great there yeah, isn't really a specific uh specific direction yes two which months, is good which is great two months heather just got their puppy two days ago well that's it's gonna oh, be oh that's cool it's exciting couple weeks we have um, a handful of videos that are like first week home first month home that yeah. will be really helpful for we you we have a few like puppy series of um like what we do with our puppies uh when we first bring them home we have had a border collie named euchre she has a series all about what we, when we first brought her home and then our most recent uh puppy five alive we did one for him as well so you might find those really helpful rebecca greenspan dropped a ten dollar super chat early and, and rebecca Becca knows nice. that when you drop a super chat here, you get me to two. That's right. I can't help it. But Rebecca's question is, I have a four and a uh, four and a half uh, CK, uh, CKC Spaniel. Uh, she's regressed terribly. And the only change has been I found a very tiny kitten that has needed bottle feeding. So it sounds like maybe your time is split now, Rebecca, or something like that. It sounds like the f- almost five month old uh, Spaniel has regressed mm-hmm. terribly. And the only change... Uh, has been that I found a very tiny kitten that needs bottle feeding. It's- so I think sometimes what happens is regardless of, of the the attention being a way to, to um, helping this kitten, um, the age that your puppy is, they're starting yeah. to get into a really normal period where puppies... Um, they change a little bit when they're really baby puppies, like up until like... 14, 15 weeks or so. They're so inexperienced. They're so new. They're in a brand new place. They kind of stick to us a little bit more like glue. They're they're not quite as confident to kind of do things on their own. But when we hit about four months and we start to move forward, um, our dogs are usually more comfortable in their surroundings and they're investigating. They're trying to figure out the rules. They're trying to figure out who's in charge and, and what things are allowed when. And um, so regardless of, of um, the, the change that you have, Mm -hmm. It could have happened anyways, and it's very, very, very normal. Um, So to work through this, it's really important that this is such a prime age to be training and to be doing stuff. Um, It also is really important to have great supervision and to be making good management choices so that your puppy isn't being allowed to, you know, see if the couch tastes good and then get away with that or um, be able to, to make poor choices and then not really have you close by. So good management, starting to do your training and know that, that it's normal, but it doesn't mean that you're just going to ride the wave. You you really need to dig in there and do something about it. You know, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning. I mentioned that our um, Heart Talk supporters, their names are in green, but our moderation team, their names are in blue. So if they're if you look at your chat, names in blue, they're part of the McCann Dogs crew. And I see Dan, <laughs> the moderator man. I know instructor, Alexis, instructor, Robbie, instructor, Aaron are all in our chat mm-hmm. tonight. And Dan, the moderator man, lots of links, Luton. He's been here for a long time with us. Um, Dropped a link for the truth about the teenage phase. So, ah, yeah, good part, one. Moving through that teenage phase can be challenging and frustrating. Mm-hmm. And you think, boy, oh boy, they've forgotten everything that I taught them. It's really common and yeah. uh, very natural. So planning, you know, going back to the basics, planning for your puppy to maybe not make the best choices is going to be really important. And remember, only four and a half months. Like, yeah. you're, that's How much very, really very know? young at this point. Yeah. They're learning everything everything right now and they're getting it it's like very it's very similar to like when a baby first starts to walk and like they're just curious and they want to try everything it's the same thing when puppies hit about that four month mark they just they change in their curiosity and it just means that we have to change our tactics because they don't stay the same as they do in a uh, as a baby puppy um so let's uh, dive in i like this question from amanda tuckerman how is deegan doing Mm. haven't heard or seen her much on the channel anymore Deegan is, uh, uh, honestly, in a roundabout way, she is the reason that this channel got started in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. Here's why. So uh, many years ago, uh, Deegan is about to turn 18 years old. 
She's still a happy-go-lucky, goofy Labrador retriever. A, a very uh, old one. Vi yeah, a very old. old one. Moves a little slower, <laughs> she does. but she still gets happy when she you bring out the toys. She doesn't see very well, no. but she just dawdles along. Absolutely. Yes, still goes on her walks. Yep. But um, so Deegan was the reason that I went to McCann Dogs. I was in your position at one point in time. Ooh. I went to McCann Dogs with my wild and crazy black lab. I thought, <laughs> there's no way anyone could train this dog. I, there's no way I can train it, that's for sure. <laughs> I would get uh, my neighbors down the street uh, where we live would shout, like, who's walking who? Because she would just be pulling me at the end of the leash, spinning around in a circle, and it was so frustrating. So uh, I took her to my vet, and um, my vet couldn't assess her. And he said, listen, you have to go over to McCann Dogs. Uh, you know, you, she, you, your dog needs a little bit more listening skills, a little bit more control. I can hardly even assess her. So to be completely honest, I wasn't too jazzed about going to dog training. I, I, wasn't, really, I wasn't really sure. And uh, I, Did you think you could just do it on your own? I thought maybe, yeah. I don't really know what I or thought. Or didn't understand the worth, maybe. I, that was that's probably yeah. it. I, yeah. Number one, I didn't understand the worth. Number two, I didn't understand the potential. Right. So that's good. Th I mean, that was huge, yeah. and this is why this channel exists. So um, lesson one, I go in my, my grade one class, and I'm just amazed at all the instructors and their dogs and all the things that they were doing. And then I get a couple of lessons in to my my grade one class and my life skills class, and. Uh, I started to see a transformation, and I was pretty skeptical about using food in training. I, you know, mm. I, I just wasn't sure. I was concerned about, you know, becoming dependent. All the things that I see you guys talk about, all the things that I get it. But what I saw was a true transformation. Like Deegan actually wanted to listen. I could actually go to the ballpark and watch a game with my dog, and that was everything to me. Yeah. It opened up the world for her and I. This is many years ago. So mm -hmm. um, I fell in love with dog training. I, I was showing up every day. I would like rent out the halls back when we, you yeah. could rent them out. I'd rent out the training halls when there wasn't training going on. And I'd be in there doing our exercises and doing our thing. I wasn't quite dancing like this, but it, <laughs> I, I just enjoyed it. And at some point, uh, I was asked if I wanted to become an apprentice. And I said, absolutely. Um, so uh, long story short, I did my year uh, or so apprenticeship, became an instructor, and it was all because of Deegan. Mm -hmm. Moved down the road, I met Kale. Kale was the trainer of the trainers. Uh, yep. I met Kale. Her and I were uh, the best of friends for several years. And long story short, uh, now we're married. Now we're married. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, funny sort it's of. A round long time ago there. now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's sort of a bit of an origin story for the channel. But I'll tell you, I wanted to uh, publish content that I wanted to publish content that would have helped me in my position because. Oh, just one second. Deegan is doing well. Did yes. we actually answer that? Yeah, I think so. She oh. said she dolls oh, oh, around. Oh, okay, okay, you're right, yeah. right, right. Um, I also thought we told all the story I, and then we I, didn't say she was okay. I won't miss the super <laughs> chat. We'll go back to that. Uh, from uh, PNEs, please. Um, oh, we're oh I, sorry. So this is the kind of content that I think will help you avoid the challenges. Uh, honestly, a big part of this channel is about helping you understand your dog training, mm -hmm. understanding it. It's, uh, you know, if you know the why behind a lot of this stuff, it's going to allow you to make decisions in the future when you encounter something new. So it's so important to us to not just, okay, here's an example of a dog and here's, here's how we're gonna teach him to whatever, respond to his yeah, name. Yeah, it's, it's such about a small piece of training. 100% and, be, you know, we're. We have 500 dogs a week come into our training facility. We have nearly a thousand online students. We know that not every single dog is gonna respond the mm -hmm. same way right. to the same thing. But if you understand the why, that allows you to make some to make some decision making. Yeah. You know, we're not painting a line on the floor saying, do it this way, go this way. Because what if somebody puts a chair in the way? Mm -hmm. Then what? Mm -hmm. You know, if you understand where you're going and why you're going there, it makes it just allows you to be successful. And uh, without getting emotional, you know, it's uh, really exciting to uh, see the connection in, in some of the comments. When we meet some of our students online, you know, I hear some of the stories about the YouTube channel. And um, it's exciting because it's what I would have wanted for me. Yeah. You know, uh, so it, you know. I saw somebody I comment the other on the post that I just put out about one million subscribers. She's like, you stopped me from like 
many nights of crying because Listen. I was so frustrated yeah. with my puppy and like said that she didn't really like her puppy that much because all yeah. she was doing and that was just being frustrated and then yeah. she started the training and now like she just feels completely different about it and that's that's just the great thing we we want people to have dogs because they're a part of your family and that they listen well and they want to do things with you so that you can actually enjoy them they're not meant to be in a backyard every right. day and totally. like not go out and do things they're so capable and they they enrich your life so much more, but they do that if they listen well. So that's sort of the goal. You know, we mentioned brief. Actually, Dan made us this. Let's go to this. Look at that. Oh, that nice? it's very sparkly. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. We, we talked briefly about, uh, I mentioned briefly about potential. And let let me tell you, you, you don't yet understand what your dog is capable of. You really don't. I know I didn't. I see it all the time in our students when they're like, I can't believe that, you know, he comes when I call him. Every beginning of every session, we say, who believes that their dog will run from one end of this building to the other and sit in control in front of you? And people are like, there's no way. And then Kale or, or uh, your mom, Deb, would you, would say, say it, I believe, I believe, because it's going to happen. And we see it time after time after time. <laughs> but right now, it doesn't even seem possible. But the little bits and pieces of information that we, you know, dripping out to you or when you come and work with us, uh, you know, I know it's a little bit different example because it's a little bit more dynamic, yeah. but um, it's, it, it's there. Your dog has the potential. Do not give up on them because believe me, you just haven't figured out how to unlock that potential yet. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Um, okay, I, sure a couple super chats here. I missed one. Okay. The yellow one. I yeah, let first. me grab this for you, Kale, and then I'm going to... Uh, from this right here. Okay. Uh, from Peenies, please. Question on the left side control. Wouldn't the right side control protect the dog from oncoming people and dogs? Please share your logic for teaching the left side and clarify if left side, con left side control is intentional. <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. Um, so really, what you want your dog to do is understand what walking at your side means in terms of the leash respect. To be perfectly honest, whether they walk at the left or the right, isn't really that important. It stems from a long, 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 long time ago, um, you know, initially when dogs were, you know, going and helping um, in the war and that type of thing, you know, the soldiers would have the gun on their right and their dog on their left, and it just stemmed into obedience training. So it's, it's sort of traditional. Um, uh, if you do competitive obedience or a lot of extra dog activities um, where you would compete, the dogs at the left for a lot of those things so it just sort of that way if it's just about walking your dog at home in your neighborhood and walking them on the right would be uh, better for you to do that that would be okay too but what we want to do is make sure that the expectation of how the dog should walk is the same so me personally i'm uh, i do a lot of high level agility training and my dog everything that she knows to do on the left she needs to do exactly the same on my right. So I actually train my dogs to walk on both the left and right so that I can do whatever I need to do. Um, but the expectation of her is the same, to be at my side, to be close, um, her head near the side of my leg, my leash is loose, there's slack in it. So uh, it really is about expectation. So it's sort of traditional. Um, it is intentional because that's sort of how we teach all of our programs because it helps for continuity and um, consistency for the dog's expectation but in the big picture of just at home life it doesn't matter uh, I want to say hello to Brian McLogan thanks for joining us here in the train station and with a dancing for, pair thank you for the super oh sticker. you just did a mic drop did you see that I saw that that's wow. pretty great uh, thanks for joining us Brian um, so we also have a question from Jamie Jamie, uh, 10 week old. I can read it better here. Oh, good. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, with a 10 week, um, with a 10 week brand new pup, how do you troubleshoot when to let them cry it out versus intervene more so they are not reinforcing anxious behavior? This is a really good question. And this is actually a really common question that we get from a lot of our puppy essentials students um, that have new puppies. And I would assume this is probably related to crate training. Um, or something similar to that. This is a common place that we see crate training. So um, with a tummy puppy, that's a pretty new puppy. So I would um, I would tend to, to lean towards letting them cry it out initially when they're that young. Where I decide to intervene is if I feel that the dog is like a puppy is working itself into a tizzy, then I might intervene from there. What? Into a tizzy? Into a tizzy, you know, like okay. a tizzy. All right. Like Oh, well, a tizzy. Okay. God. Or, Is that a um, word? yeah, like a. I know, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, or, you broke my train of thought. I'm sorry. 
uh, dogs working himself into a tizzy. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or they, um, if this has been a rehearsed thing, so if you're, they're crying it out and crying, as you've been in, a, you know, a week or so into it, yeah. uh, and it's not really making any changes, then I would intervene from there. Um, you want to make sure that you're not reinforcing anxious behavior. You're right. So how you uh, intervene is important. I wouldn't intervene by going, by going to them and saying, "Shh, it's okay, it's okay." That's not intervening. I would interrupt them. I might say, "Hey, hey, hey, quiet," and use a st- sterner voice. I might do a tap, tap, tap on the crate just to kind of stop them for a second. I'm not trying to scare them, but rather sort of startle them. And, and oh, my dear God, what is that? It's a moth. Okay. Got also, it. did you just catch that in the air on camera? If you did, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I think it was so. like, I yeah. saw it go that way. Anyway, like a sorry. small bird. I am so sorry, uh, Jamie. I am all over the place with your answer, but hopefully we're getting there and I'm going to finish right now. Um, so if your puppy is making... Um, noise and we're intervening by soothing we are definitely going to be reinforcing the behavior but if we interrupt it which is going to give us a moment of silence so the puppy sort of go oh what was that that gives me an opportunity to say yes good puppy good quiet and i can use my voice to praise while the puppy is actually quiet that way i'm reinforcing the right things and not the wrong things peonies please hopefully you're able to work through that specifically for peonies please (laughs) oh that was a good tooth there hon like a massive tooth. Good one. Uh, Candresa, with a good question here. Uh, my eight-month-old puppy plays too rough. He bites the other dog's collars and harnesses. I've tried clapping and bitter spray, but nothing yet. The other dog's equipment is still too interesting and self-reinforcing for him. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about management and control in that situation specifically, um, and maybe what situations the dog is in that maybe they're uh, finding themselves <laughs> the opportunity to yeah. bite dog collars and harnesses. Yeah. Um, so we sort of have like sort of a golden rule with our dogs when they're young, and that is we don't really let them do a lot of play like that until we feel that we could control them um, easily without without. Um, without a lot of issues. So I basically use the freedom to play with a lot of other dogs as a reward yeah. for being a good listener. Yeah. Because what happens is, what, what's happened with your puppy, is your dogs learn to play in rough house and get a lot of value um, by you know biting the other dog's equipment or whatever it might be. And when you're trying to stop them or you're trying to get them to listen, the puppy's now said, that I don't need to do that. This is really reinforcing. This is a lot of fun. So you're successfully teaching your dog that you're not important. So we like to do it the other way around. We want to first build a lot of value on response to name, on recall, maybe on leave it, maybe a sit or a down command. And we want to really make sure that that's really, really good. And then when we would get to the point where we would let them interact and have a little play with another dog, it would be controlled. So maybe both dogs are dragging a leash or a long line and they're in a smaller area. We might let them play Mm -hmm. for a few moments and then call the dogs away and get them to sit or get them to focus. And then as a reward, let them go back and play again. Yeah. We don't just let them have a free-for-all and then say, gosh, I would really like to get my dog back right now and they're not listening to me. So you just need to reverse your order. You need to be getting a little bit more control and reinforcement from you, a little bit more focus from you. And then as a reward, uh, on top of the physical rewards you should be giving your dog, a reward could be the ability to go and play with the other dogs. Just I wouldn't necessarily do it the other way around right now because your puppy's just showing you that they're not quite ready to have that that luxury as of yet. We, uh, we are building some things here in the train station. And uh, I think... Uh, Dan, the mo- Dan the moderator man sent me a note he said is there like elevator music playing and oh. uh, we have a store under construction just outside of the train station or off to the side of the train station mm. so that's probably what was going on there uh, Dan, let, let me know could you guys hear it do you want oh. do you want a low little maybe it's like a little uh, mood uh, I don't mood music I don't know what you call it like a background music as we chat away here I did don't. you just say Mood music. Yeah, I, don't, I couldn't think of what I wanted to call it. it and you just made fun it, of me for saying tizzy. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, next. So we got here. Uh, Margaret Boonstra. Let me grab her thing here. Margaret Boonstra. Awesome help so far. Thank you. Aww, well, thank, thank you, you Margaret. Margaret. We do appreciate it. And I saw that. Uh, Luke Skywalker dropping 99 cents. Wow, so I popular. Guess the force might be with us now. Thanks, Luke. Yeah. Uh, Luke Skywalker actually has got a question here. <laughs> Dan, the here mute, mood music has got me in a tizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Depends uh, on what music you're listening from to, I Luke suppose. Skywalker. Um, I have a seven month old puppy and he barks at us when we eat. It won't 
we don't and never gave him from our plate. What should we do? Okay, this is really good. This reminds me of something that we've been really paying attention to lately, specifically with like default behaviors. Um, and it's probably something that we should create a video about mm. showing like some of the first steps. If you watch uh, oh, our- we talked about this the other day. If you, you watch our mm -hmm. Five Alive puppy series, you'll see us making a bunch of choices. And at the time it might've been like, oh, that's cute. They're just doing this mm -hmm. thing with that puppy, uh, making him go lie on his bed or he's going to do this thing. But we should do an update with yeah. the, with Five, showing you what the result is. Because mm. it, I mean, we're very- he's lovely. He is lovely, but he, we also have a bunch of default behaviors yeah, that, that are exactly created. what we want. Mm -hmm. So for Luke Skywalker, if he has their dog, uh, barking or whining at them. Yeah, I can tell dinner. you exactly what we did with, with five because this was something that I didn't want to happen with him. I wanted him to learn to, you know, just go and do his own thing eventually when we were to, to sit down and eat. So um, initially when he was a really young puppy and he required me to, you know, be a little bit more engaged with him and pay attention to him, he was in his crate while we ate dinner. And I would let him kind of run around a little bit while I was getting dinner ready so that I could kind of watch him and pay attention. Then when we sat down to eat, he would go in his crate. From there, so during that time, I was also teaching him how to lie on a dog bed and remain in position. And I started that with him when he was like nine weeks old. And again, it was baby, baby stuff. Go on the bed, reward every couple of seconds, and then teach him to wait for a release and then get off. It was very simple. He was got a lot of value for lying on the bed. Um, and so I would do that as a training uh, session for weeks um, leading up to then implementing the bed near where I was sitting to have dinner. So I would have the bed there. I would give him something to do, give him a chew bone, give him a Kong full of some goodies. And I would have the leash on and I would just have him hang out on the bed beside me, um, you know, doing his own thing while we were eating. But again, he already at this point, he has tons of value. Yeah. He likes to lie on the bed. He yeah. likes to do do, you know his bed thing and to be honest the first little time he would be good for a couple minutes but being a puppy he would then get a little bit busy and I might have to get up and you know encourage him to go back to the bed the bed was very close to me and then ever so often if I was irritated enough I was like okay we're not ready for this length of time maybe and I would very happily take him back to his crate and then through time the puppy got to learn to, to do a little bit better so you need to give your dog an alternative um, job to do instead of uh, barking at you um, that's more productive that the dog finds more uh, helpful so I would definitely use the, utilize the crate. And then in the meantime, while you're crate training during that time, um, you need to be teaching the dog to lie in a bed or mat. I find that's just an easy, easy thing to do. And the dogs love it. Uh, now that we've removed that uh, audio, I'm wondering. There you go. Mm. You sound okay? Oh, there's our buddy. I think that the audio is probably fine, I think. Is it? I think so. Uh, yeah, okay. We're oh, good. We're thanks. Good. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> the most ridiculous thing. I can't believe we do it almost every show. It is so dumb. Uh, but it's funny, and that's we like to have fun with this ridiculous uh, We're show. funny. Um, okay, I saw a couple great questions come in here that weren't super chats, but I like them. Um, uh, I just saw a couple. There was a conversation going on about whether we were going to have um, online classes for Life Skills 2 and 3. Yep. And... Um, uh, people are like, I heard you're doing 2, but not 3. So in our in-house... Uh, program we have um puppy essentials we have life skills one two three and then even a four as well and agility and so we are slowly eventually going to have all of it online it just takes quite a while to put it together so um you'll have to be patient but just know that is our intention uh so you we will have um just a huge, uh, huge options for you guys online, but um, not anytime soon, but I just wanted to make sure that people weren't confused by that. Uh, from John uh, LaCiori, I, I hope I spelled your, pronounced your name correctly. Uh, fourth old uh, pup chase a frisbee, won't, won't try to catch, can I get her to jump and try to catch? Does instructor Carol do privates on for disc dog? Um, sometimes. Yeah. I wonder, uh, we are doing a re reliable retrieve, uh, of course, in October. Disc, right? Yeah. It's heavily, heavily disoriented. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so John, that might be an opportunity. We do have, uh, she, she's a five-time world champion at Disc Dog. She's an incredible dog trainer and an amazing lady. And instructor Carol is putting on a reliable retrieve course that might be good for you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say something, though. Yeah. Uh, Four-month-old shouldn't really be jumping for a first bee right yeah. now anyways. We don't actually let our dogs jump for a first bee until they're closer to a year old. And Carol is going to tell you that if you work with her. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to make sure. Don't try so hard because I, it's actually I, really bad for them. Yeah, physically it's hard on them. Physically, but, um, yeah. You know what I was just thinking about was um, I think we have a video. Yeah, I think we have a video that talks about how John could do fetch with rollers. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. I can't. Sometimes I lose track of where all these videos are. If they're on where they are, mm -hmm. I think I think we did one for YouTube, um, John. So just maybe check like. I don't know, McCann Dogs Frisbee or mm -hmm. Disc Dog. Uh, maybe there's something there. Yeah. Uh, something that I wanted to point out, Mariah Larson uh, mentioned, I can't stop my 14-week-old puppy from running away from me when I'm trying to get something dangerous from him. So what, what do we do in <laughs> From order him, not for him. Yeah. <laughs> So what do we do? You know, how do we manage those uh, dogs in the situation? Um, well, in those situations, um, again, you always have um, prevention, and then you also have correction, and you also have teaching the puppy what they should be doing. So in the McCann Method, what we're trying to do is make sure that we train the dog to have skills that we can use in situations like this so that we don't end up having to chase after the puppy or get to the point where the puppy even feels like they want to keep things from us. Mm -hmm. I don't want my puppy to feel that if he picks something up that he should hide it from me or take it away from me. I want to have done a bunch of you know relationship and fetch and all kinds of stuff prior to that, leave it, drop it, so that if he picks up something, I can very quickly say, drop it. And the puppy goes, okay, no problem, because I've rehearsed it so much. So training a drop it, training a leave it would be something that's really important. And there's no reason why you couldn't start doing that already at a 14-week-old puppy. There's lots you can do. Um, prevention would be the other thing. So if the puppy was on a long line or a leash or something in the house, outside of the house, wherever they happen to be when they're out of their crate, um, that would be a really safe and quick way to stop the puppy from running away and allowing you to get control. So rather than chasing the puppy, you can simply step on the line, which would give you easy access to the puppy to remove that, that dangerous item. So I would work a little bit more on the training aspect of it, but then I would also um, make sure that you have good management skills, um, supervision, and then having a leash or line on the dog which will make oh so many things not even just getting things from them a whole bunch of other things really helpful dan lots of links looting <laughs> our moderator man actually Aww. he's, he's uh, posting up at studio 905 right now uh love oh, hold on this is one up uh lots of links Love being part of this team. Congrats for hitting 1 million ken and kale Yay. uh everyone throw some love in the chat for them well thank you dan thanks Appreciate buddy that. Um, did I toot? I probably tooted. Um, I hope you didn't. I think I did. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's go. To oh, Barb says, Kale followed your video stopping puppy from crying in the crate at night on Sunday. Great nights. No crying once we put his food and treats in his crate. I am a new subscriber now. Thank you. Oh, Aww, that's so that's nice, great. Barb. I'm so glad to hear. Very cool. I always love when we get feedback about, you know, things working and then people having success. It makes us feel really happy. From Sasha, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Eleven uh, week old Cavadoodle, uh, Cavoodle puppy freaks out when we correct <laughs> nipping with the collier side hold shown in one of your videos. Any tips to avoid scaring him? Mm. Um, I hesitate to answer this because it is so technique specific. Um, so. If the, if the technique is done uh, correctly, it is not uncommon for puppies to um, get a little riled up before they calm down, um, but it shouldn't scare the puppy. So mm. it could be that um, maybe your timing's a little bit off or your technique's a little bit off. Um, and unless, unless I was able to physically see what you were doing, mm. to, I would it's be able to, to tell you exactly what you needed to do differently. Um, so it is really, it's sort of challenging to answer that question without without knowing a little bit more. Um, Maybe you could do some more handling exercises yeah. with the dog and like make it a little bit more uh, rewarding to you know have the to yeah. take the collar, do you know exercises that include just like literally for some dogs it's as little as like patting and touching, yeah. touching their tail, actually. Uh, Dan, maybe you can drop a link to the video uh, preparing for the vet assessment. That would be a great one uh, in this situation, yeah. I think. Just yeah, some that's of those exercises. a really good suggestion. Yeah. So, you know, if the puppy is a little bit unsure about that, you want to make sure that the only time that you're um, – holding the puppy in that manner isn't just when you're upset about something, you're correcting something. The dog needs to make sure that when we take the collar, as Ken mentioned, or hold the dog against us or, um, you know, brace them against us, that we're also doing that while we're giving treats and petting yeah. and praising so that our puppies um, understand it's, it's, you know, we love them. We just don't like their annoying behavior that they're doing and we need to be able to um, relax them and sort of de-escalate them a little bit more quickly. 
Oh, man, with a really nice message. If you're a student, I don't know if you are a student, but if you're a student, I would definitely reach out to your instructors uh, because you can post a video and um, they will be able to watch exactly what you're doing and they can fix your technique in yeah. literally seconds. So um, I don't know if you're a student or not, but if you are, take advantage of that. Amanda, uh, sorry, late to the party. I'm so happy, so happy for you guys. Our first two months have been amazing with our puppy and it's 100% because Aww. of what I've learned. Thank you very much, Amanda. That's really It makes kind. us feel better. That's certainly why we're doing this here on YouTube for sure. Um, from Kenj, Ken, Kenja, Kad, 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 Kadja, uh, can, a puppy, that. can a puppy be too food motivated? I like this question. Can a puppy be too food motivated? My puppy barks a lot following commands. He will walk away or lie down in front of me seemingly out of frustration for not getting food hmm. fast enough. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, it's, again, it's hard to say without seeing you specifically working yep. on this, but maybe a couple common mistakes that people make. Yeah. I don't think I would phrase it. I, I don't think a puppy can be too food motivated. In fact, I think the more motivated by food um, that they are, the easier it is to get them to, to listen uh, because they really want what you have. However, it does mean that your timing and how you use the food and how you reward the food and uh, when you use it is going to be more important than someone who has a dog that's less motivated by the food uh, because you have a dog that is really hyper-focused on, on what you're doing. Um, frustration barking or those reactions are usually because of confusion or maybe the rate of reward is not uh, coming enough or maybe um, you're testing the puppy and asking him to do something that he doesn't really understand. Therefore, he's like, I don't get what you're asking. Like if I asked you to do something in a completely different language and you didn't do it and I just kept asking you and asking you and I was holding something help. in front, it, you're like... So I, I don't get it. So, yeah. um, you know, when you have a young dog, you have to really um, start off very simply um, and reward very often and just be careful that you're not putting the puppy in a situation where you're asking them to do something that they truly don't really understand yet. But um, there really isn't something as a dog being too too food motivated. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the Use that to your dog advantage. Could be, a little, could be being a little bit pushy. And I'm thinking it about... It could be um, pushy, yeah. We did a video recently. Maybe teaching a settle sit. Maybe doing some rule outs would be a really helpful be thing good, for yeah. a high value yeah. uh, dog. Settle and sit would be mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Um, uh, Instructor high Carol, value food dog. you know what? Instructor Carol, uh, we did a, um, a leadership uh, quiz in the last couple of weeks. Take that leadership quiz. Yeah. See what you think. See if your puppy's showing off some of those other behaviors that go along with some of those, uh, you know, challenging uh, leadership positions. Um, excuse me. There's also you can download like a full version. Mm -hmm of a leadership assessment and you might find that like, oh, I have three or four of these things that I need to work on. That would be great for you uh, uh, to go through. Uh, a couple more super chats and I'm uh, way behind on my toots. Um, <laughs> you gotta get rid, rid of some of those, I think. Katie. Katie, my dog, uh, my dog, my dog escaped the backyard this week. I called her and she came running back. Thank God. All because of life skills. You guys literally saved us. We will train McCann forever. Thank you. Oh, That's really yes, nice. Yes, Katie is one of our life skills students. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really, really That cool. is exactly why we put so much work into that recall because we don't want you to have to use it in, a, in an emergency situation. Right. But boy, if our dogs get into that scenario, we want to feel so confident that if we all come, the dogs are like, yep, I'm there. And uh, that's so great. That's congratulations, Katie, because, you know, we can give you information, but you have to do stuff with the information. So you've obviously done worked really hard on that. So Yeah. And, you know, uh, Katie, uh, we, I, I had a similar experience with Deegan year, many years ago uh, when we were out for a walk. And the thing that really connected with me uh, was the fact that because of because of the progressions and the steps that you've taken, steps are important and not allowing your dog to rehearse the bad stuff because your dog's learning 100% of the time, whether yeah. you're in the process of giving them good information or they're getting bad information. So you've obviously set your dog up to, you know, really find it valuable to listen to you, mm -hmm. to respond. Whatever the possibility of that thing was, uh, he or she, or she gets, got to, uh, it, that he would get to, um, was it he? that she, that she would get to, um, it was way more valuable to turn back and run to you. And that's crucial with, for all of you guys that are training a puppy, think about that. They're always learning all of the time. Yeah. So make sure you're giving them the right information. Don't allow them to rehearse the bad stuff because they're just as likely to find out the good stuff and make the good choices as they are to find out the bad stuff yeah. and make the bad choice. It's up to you, but that's, you know, it's, it's up to you to make those decisions and, and manage them properly. Mm -hmm. Katie, we're so excited for you. And I'm so happy to hear that um from beth monk 
that says, my dog is doing well, uh, leash walking, thanks for your video, but loses his mind when big trucks go by. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, first of all, I would need to know what you mean by losing his mind. Is it that the dog wants to chase the trucks? Is it that the dog is worried by the trucks and they're trying to flee? Because um, the response that I would give you would be entirely different from one another if it was uh, fear-based versus... Um, like uh, yeah. stimulation base. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and guess it's stimulation base because of, of the wording that, that you've used. And this is a guess. Two, um, these are, there are two different solutions. Yeah, 50, or a few 50, different solutions. 50 50 chance. I'll, yeah. I'll keep watching the chat. Maybe you'll, maybe okay. you'll tell me. Um, maybe you'll explain it more. Uh, but if the dog is. Um, highly stimulated by that motion going past and they're trying to chase it uh, the best thing to do is to get the dog into a calmer mental state um, before the truck comes by so you need to anticipate the trucks coming and you need to move further away from the from the road area so that you can control the dog a little bit better um, and then get the dog doing a more controlled behavior maybe it's sitting at your side on a loose leash we teach a control position at our left hand side in our, our training programs um, and we have our students use that position in all kinds of scenarios where they need the dog to be more calm-minded. Um, so you would need to find, he is scared of it, uh, sorry. but wants to chase. Hold on. Go here. I think I saw it. He's scared of it, but wants to chase. Um, okay. If he's scared of it, then um, it, similar answer, uh, but I would not force the dog to stay seated near something that they were worried about. I would, however, um, utilize the distance comment that I've made. So I would turn and move away. Um, I might redirect the dog's focus. So if the dog's a bit worried, if your dog, like I had a dog um, that was quite stimulated by the cars, not worried about them, but stimulated by them. So what I would do when a car would come is I would get her focus on me and then we would play a little game of tug, which she loved to do. Um, and you know, within a week or so of doing that, she would actually look at the car and then anticipate the tug yeah. and start looking back at me as in, come on mom, we're gonna play, right? We're gonna do that yeah. thing. Um, so I could switch her mind frame to something that was a bit more enjoyable. You could, you know, have your dog do their favorite trick. You could ask them to sit or down. Something that gets your pup happy, not stressed. Because if you make them sit and hold position and they're worried about that thing, that's not, the pup, pup, puppy's not going to put a lot of trust into you. So um, build more distance and redirect the dog's focus to something different that gets your dog in a more confident mind, mind uh, frame, which is going to be different for everybody. And, and hopefully you would be able to, to know what your dog would prefer. Yeah, I, I like that though. And, and, and as you mentioned, distance is your friend. That might mean that you're like three streets over from where the big trucks drive. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in the back Walk of the Walk at a car. different time of day. Yeah, or, yeah. Really mm -hmm. go out of your way to not rehearse the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the scary truck sound. But it's kind of like lightning, or, and, sorry, thunder. You know, it, it, it's, it can be unpredictable. So have a plan. What are you going to do if you think you're, you're about to run into a situation with that loud noise that your dog doesn't like? Mm -hmm. So this is a tough question to answer. Amanda, uh, I'll answer your question in a second. That's yeah, a funny actually, question. <laughs> um, is there a way to stop fence jumping? Well, in reality, if your dog is able to jump over the fence, they're going to continue to do that. Yeah. Un unless fence jumping's fun. Absolutely. And all that freedom. It's also very dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about some of the, the management and, uh, I mean, training. We could work a little bit on the training of this, but the reality is supervision and management are key to this. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, beyond getting a taller fence, which, you know, is an unlikely scenario. How high can they jump? <laughs> right. Yeah, supervision is going to be really important. The thing is, when a dog does, when the dog escapes from a backyard or gets out of a gate or crawls under a fence or jumps over a fence, whatever, however they are, and then they get to escape or they get to chase something or they get to eat out of the garbage or whatever it is that they're trying to escape for, um, that's rewarding. So the next time they're in that scenario, they're going to look to do those things again. So supervision is absolutely key. It's pretty hard for a dog to jump a fence if you have a leash on and you're standing with them. Um, what would be ideal is if your dog did try to go towards the fence to jump and you could stop them with a leash or line and stop them in their tracks and then redirect them to something else. Call them back over, you know, um, do something that, that it gets your dog's focus back on you. But that dog definitely needs um, a lot more supervision. I would maybe do some training with that dog near the fence um, so that the dog is learning to focus on you on leash, you know, so that 
your dog's doing some control behaviors, I might practice my recall there um, just to build a little bit more attention on you in, in that scenario that seems to be um, troublesome for the dog. Um, trying to catch up with our super chats. Just give me one um, I just want to go back up to Amanda's question. She asked okay, sort of a funny one there. One second. Uh, okay. Here. On. Uh, Kale, random question that keeps me lying awake at night. Uh, is there a reason you pump up and down getting the dog to go up and down uh, when you are tugging with the dogs? Um, so honestly, we kind of let the dog go in the direction that they want to. So people often say like, gosh, you tug so hard with the dogs. Um, but we often, Ken's really good at getting the dogs to tug. Um I, I enjoy but we that. yeah, but we we sort of tailor to what the dog wants to do. Um, I really work on a lot of tugs, so when you see me in videos tugging with my own dogs, um, they tug like crazy because I play with them a lot. Although we have a little toy poodle that doesn't tug like crazy, so when I tug with her, I hold the toy and then I like tickle her sides, and she just thinks that's really great. I wouldn't like pull back, yeah. um, but we don't like whip the dog around. We kind of let the dog dictate the direction and the speed, and then we just match it. With with that said, you know if you do have a dog that that's starting to get engaged or, or a dog that loves mm. to tug, you want to ride the edge. You yeah. know, you really want to make it engaging. Work with resistance too. Yeah, for sure. I know when I was trying to get five to tug harder when he was a really ba baby puppy, like 10, 10, 15 weeks old, um, I would tug with one hand and then I would take my other hand and I would actually like Hold push against his yeah. chest yep. and not pull, pop up and down. I would just pull, 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 Great pull, tension. pull. And then he would bite harder. Yeah. And then as soon as he would, I would, yeah, good boy. And I would give the tension back so I'd let him win. I didn't let go of the toy. And so he he learned if he tugged more, I would let him have the toy more. So it was a way to kind of build it up. So yeah, there you go. Hopefully you don't have to have any more sleepless nights. Uh, <laughs> Trista, where? Uh, burning question. How do you come up with your dog's names? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I have an app or a phone thing, uh, a note in my phone that probably has like a hundred dog names. And I just... I think of a name and then I put it in my phone and then I look at it from time to time and then just get things off the list um, yeah. that I don't like. But I, I have there, sort of there's a, a structure. Yeah, there's a structure. Number one for my dogs is my dogs always have double names. So they have to have like two names. So Grand Slam, Funky Monkey, Jitterbug, Ping Pong, Beeline, Hippie Shake. Five Alive, they all have like two names. I very rarely call them by their full name. In fact, they have ridiculous nicknames. Yeah. Um, I also, for agility, whatever name I'm gonna call them, um, needs to be like short and sweet. So like sharp. it needs to be like one syllable because that's, you got to get the name out really quickly. So like B or Grand Slam, I don't call them grand, I call them slam because it's sharp and like, mm -hmm. yeah, five. Like it's just fast to call. Um, and then it needs to be unique. I don't like to name my dogs anything that I've heard before. So if somebody else has a name, then I usually will try to come up with something more unique. Um, I also like my dogs to have an emoji. <laughs> That's like a fairly, you know, recent thing. I don't know. I'd say so. They're, they're ridiculous names. They all have some type of meaning. Every single dog has some type of meaning behind where I've come up with the name, but those, that's my basic structure. For, uh, for Other people might not like them, but. For, and, and I just choose based on, uh, is this name awesome? And yes, that's pretty much all. This, that's all I had. And Mac came with his name because yeah, he was a, a herding dog that yep. we that we bought. Like he was a trained herding dog. And then Deegan is what she. Uh, that's a, a motorcycle motorcycle yeah. rider that you liked. Yep. Um, and then Rad was my favorite movie. Yeah, well, you were going to name him Atticus, and I shut that no, down real fast. I think Rad, Rad was Rad was at the top of the list. Rad's a really great great name. Yeah. So, uh, JL, good question uh, in regard to, to tugging. My dog tugs uh, like crazy and growls hard while his tail is wagging. He turns seven months old today. So before, I know we talk a lot about He's tugging and use, using toys. He could be absolutely enjoying himself. But when we're working on uh, like yeah. puppies and tug, um, one of the first skills that they need to learn is an out. So we'll get the tug, uh, the puppy like, I mean, if your puppy is not engaged in tug, I'm going to do a lot more tugging than I'm going to be doing out. Yeah. But our dogs know to out very early because I want to be able to use a toy in our training. It creates great relationship. Uh, the only, the, the, the most fun part of that is the fact that we're doing it together. Um, but the dog, I want you to focus on your dog having a great out so that when you can, they're at the height of their play and they're having a great time and you stop and you say out, you get the out that you want or drop it or whatever term you want to use. Um, lots of, uh, Super chats. Uh, I'm trying not to miss anybody. Uh, from Pino Conte. 
uh, I, uh, hey, hi you guys, congrats. I recently subscribed to your channel. We got two puppies, a uh, 12 week old miniature and a 10, uh, I guess, month old giant poodle. I don't know what we were thinking, but uh, it's done. How do we make them great dogs? Well, that's a big question, Pino Conte. <laughs> uh, number one, separate, divide and conquer. Yes. Uh, remember these new dogs, especially bringing them home at the same time, they already speak the same language and you're going to have to convince both of they're them. They're going to think each other's cool much faster than they That's think right. you're cool. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to convince both of them that you are the ultimately the one that they need to listen to. Mm -hmm. So separate the dogs and then start, I mean, you're just going to do the individual puppy uh, thing, but you'll have to do it separately. Um, it's twice the work. It is. It is. But and you've been in the situation a handful of times, right? Uh, one time, and then Just I once? a one time, and I and then I well. I would never do it again because <laughs> it was so much work. Uh, but it was fun. It was really fun. But it was it was a lot of work. Um, but the separation. A lot of people don't want to do the separation because it does add double the time. Yeah. Um, but I can't tell you the issues that we've had with people who get two dogs at the same time that don't separate them. You get separation anxiety. You get uh, one dog kind of taking control of the relationship and another dog following. You have lack of relationship with the human. You have sometimes confidence issues. Sometimes you have bully issues. There's all kinds of things. Um, it doesn't mean that you're separating forever, though. It's important to say that just for like the initial training and relationship building time, you want the dogs to be able to develop independently of one another so that you can kind of figure out what their personalities are away from one another and once they have some training underneath their belt then they can you know then they can hang out and be buddies and that type of thing but I just wouldn't do it too too early um yeah that's great uh Thanks. Marcus in Nyland Maryland uh our 10 week old puppy an old English bulldog is constantly biting her house line or leash uh how can we focus her attention back to her training rather than playing with the leash how mm -hmm. can we redirect really common question yeah, very and common. I like that you're where your head is at right now thinking mm -hmm. about like how do we stop this problem from happening and it's a, it's really common thing that we yeah. hear what do we do when we're talking about house lines and puppy training yeah a couple things number one make sure the house line or leash is on all the time sometimes if you're only using it sometimes it's like the novelty doesn't wear off as quickly because it's like oh there's this new thing so it needs to stay on all the time when five was a puppy he initially was very excited about his house line at first but after about i would say a week or so it just started to get less and less and less because it was just there all the time yeah. the novelty the novelty wore off however um, when he would chew on the line, I would stop, I would use my voice right away, hey, hey, leave that, and I would interrupt him with my voice, and then I would immediately go over, remove the line, and give him a bone, or give him something that he should be chewing. I continually interrupted that behavior and redirected him to something that he should be doing instead. Um, it does take consistency, it does take good supervision, so that you're not, you know, sitting on your phone, and then for the last 10 minutes, your dog's been eating the, the line. That's not gonna get you anywhere. You do have to be consistent in your timing, has to be good mm -hmm. um but uh that's going to be your best bet that's going to be how you're going to redirect them you stop the dog from doing one thing redirect them to something that they should be doing and then amplify the praise uh when they do that new thing this is why supervision is so important people are terrible at supervising yeah. and so many problems uh start or continue because of lack of supervision and people but, think they're supervising right but they are not but it, it just <laughs> happens you know it sometimes you, you make a mistake yeah you get distracted you're making dinner you're doing something you're on your phone that's and the puppy makes great. a mistake and that seems to be always when they make, make the mistake and then you think mm -hmm. to yourself well I mean he never does it when I'm watching yeah it's because you're there to interrupt these behaviors but it's so important for, for your puppy's sake to be uh, supervising, to yeah. be observing. So the moment your puppy grabs their house line, you can interrupt that behavior. It's so important. But you're going to see over time, things get things get so much easier. And when your puppy is used to like dragging a house line, dragging a leash, um, you go outside and now your puppy's used to dragging a line out there. Your puppy's used to dragging a yeah. long line. So you can actually develop you know distance skills faster because your dog's not so line aware yeah and this is why we start from the very beginning we want control of that puppy because we know over the next several months we're going to be uh, you know we we have we know how much potential is in there and we have high expectations of our dogs you you can have the same high expectations of your dogs yeah. too it's just setting them up it's these big the the, the foundation the building blocks of, of great learning mm -hmm. so important mm -hmm. good question um from 
uh, Andreas, what's the safest type of bone for an 11 week old puppy? Well, this is this is a an it depends question. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it depends on your dog's um, chewing intensity. Um, it depends on their interest. Um, a couple go to bones that that we will use for our dogs is a brand called Nyla Bone. Um, a lot of their bones are made out of nylon, no. <laughs> which is why they call it Nyla Bone. Um, they often will make different. Um, um, integrities of bones so there's some that are made for puppies that are yeah. a little softer easier to chew maybe have more texture um, and then there's ones that are for stronger chewing dogs um, our recommendation with any type of a bone that you use though it should be bigger than what the package says so if it says for like a small dog then i would if you have a small dog i would get your dog a medium a dog for me a yeah. bone for medium yeah. dogs if you have a medium-sized dog i would get your dog a bone for large dogs bigger is always safer uh, because they are less likely to you know know get caught on it um, things that I would stay away from in terms of bones would be anything that your dog uh, could rip big pieces off and swallow or things at 11 weeks old that would be hard uh, and your dog could possibly um, like hurt their mouth on or, or break their teeth um, it also, when puppies are 11 weeks old, in like the next little bit, your puppy's going to start to do some teething. Um, and I find if the bones are too hard, then it really discourages chewing because it's not doesn't feel nice for the dogs to chew. I know Five went through like a couple weeks where he only wanted to chew softer things yeah. because his mouth was sore from chewing, uh, from teething. Um, so there's a couple um, examples there. Try to stay away from things like um, rawhide um, or things like that that your dog... Um, could swallow big pieces from um, rawhide's actually really really horribly healthy uh, unhealthy for your dog mm -hmm. um, and also quite dangerous so um, try to stick to things that are going to be safe choices uh, for them um, also uh, it sounds like we're, we're going to sound like a broken record but watching your your puppy what, during, supervision? During, super, yeah, supervising the first little while to see what kind of chewer they are. That's going to be really important. It doesn't matter what you're giving your dogs. You know, we could leave a stuffed toy with some of our puppies, uh, you know, and lots of our students' puppies, and nothing would happen. Mm -hmm. But um, the majority of those puppies, they're going to rip that would part. demolish it. <laughs> so you know, understanding your dog's chewing habits. Are they a tough chewer? Are they a light chewer? You know, that that's an important decision that you need to make, and you can make that dis uh, determination pretty early in their life. And then things may change over time. So anytime you give them a new toy, just have a, just watch them a little bit and see what, what are they doing with that. The other thing, especially when it comes to like bones or, you know, whether it's uh, food bones, compressed food bones or nylon bones or anything, is uh, take it away. If, it, if you think, hmm, wonder if that's too small, take it away. Because the last thing you want is for your dog to like be able to get the whole thing into their mouth. Uh, so we'll often just take a, a chew bone away when it's maybe half done you know half yeah. done just to, to avoid any issues great suggestion um here's a, a, a name we know chelsea lewis oh nice Thanks hey chelsea the train station chelsea uh congrats congrats on one million you guys are amazing we missed training with mccann awesome uh, chelsea was that's a great student from a while ago she had a uh, cattle dog yeah cattle dog puppies norma nelson thank you for the super chat norma norma says uh I'd love to see Deb and Marty sitting and talking in in your seats for one Thursday chat. I would like to see that too. Yeah. It would be fun to hear their thoughts and memories about dog training changes over the years. So Shannon has been asking forever about doing a podcast with mom and dad and yes. uh, you and I, and mm. she wants to be like the interviewer and ask questions. Yeah. But um, there's actually a couple things happening in the chat. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is this is our uh, family business 40th year anniversary. Yeah. And so we're actually going to be hosting a big 40th year anniversary celebration. Are we allowed to talk about that on here? Uh, yes, because okay. it's it's official now. Okay. Um, in October, uh, this October, there's actually a sign up list somewhere that you can an interest list. So when we finalize all the things that we're doing, you can send it out. But one of the things that we would love to do is uh, like a panel where you know mom and dad can talk yeah. about their experience and and how they came up with the business and all of the crazy growth that it's had over the years. It'd be really really exciting. So um, yeah, if you're in our area, maybe we'll do something virtually too. I don't know. I'm throwing things at things out right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, that'll be in October of this year. I know uh, I've talked to the planning committee. Uh, I've heard some suggestions from the planning committee. Yeah. And it sounds like a pretty good time. It does. Uh, I mean, it's with us, so yeah. obviously it's going to be a good time. Um, it's pretty exciting, though, 40 years, mm -hmm. you know. Um, man, a lot of dogs uh, that have come through the training facility, a lot of I trainers. I was just a twinkle in my parents' eye. That's right. That's right. 
yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, there's also lots of questions about um, our online classes as well. I know I've referenced. Oh, do you um, mean Puppy Essentials? I do mean Puppy Essentials. Oh, I was. I always get in the wrong uh, spot. Uh, yes, I do mean Puppy Essentials. So um, lots of great questions about our online classes. Obviously, we have great, great videos on YouTube, all for free, which is amazing. Um, but with our Puppy Essentials program, um, it's a lot more structured. It gives you the big picture on how, how everything fits together. Um, you know, it's very, very different than our um, than our YouTube channel. Um, but the absolute absolute best thing about any of our online programs is the support that you get from the instructors in terms of feedback in terms of coaching in terms of um instructing in terms of um watching videos we do weekly live uh classes over zoom every single week um there's so much support we also have the support of uh, support of community so you're entered into a group where you can ask questions and you get to see all of the other students uh questions and answers and so you just learn so much from one another in that regard um so it's really great so the puppies um have to be um under four months under 16 weeks to take um puppy essentials if you don't have a dog yet we do actually have another thing called uh, our puppy prep guide which is all about all the things you need to do before you get a puppy and then we have puppy essentials if your puppy is over four months um then you could take our life skills uh class and that starts to work on things that are a little bit more tailored to that age of dog um, 40 year anniversary. I'm pretty pumped for it. Yeah. Uh, we have students who travel in from all over the place, all over North America when Kale does like an agility seminar. Mm -hmm. Um, it'd be cool to see if people travel in for the 40th anniversary. I know. I know when we get like a little bit more rigid schedule about what we're doing, yeah. uh, there's pretty cool things. I think if you're a fan of the channel, there's you would very love cool this. things you coming. You'd love this event. Um, so some great super chats came in. Thank you guys for the super chats. Thank you guys for all your support. You know, we're a million subscribers. It's pretty shocking, but uh, we're excited to sh share the night with you. <laughs> so from, oh, Norm, oh, Norma, the other thing I wanted to mention, Norma Nelson, who asked if Deb and Marty could um, sit and chat. We have a video that I shot many years ago, uh, Norma, talking about Marty, talking to Marty and Deb about the history of the business. And um, Dan, I don't know what it's called. I can't remember, but um, it's on the channel. There's one on the channel, but we are look. There's some ideas for the future. Uh, certainly a podcast, uh, and maybe a. We'll figure it out. We'll figure this out. Abigail Shelter asks a question. Uh, any tips for calming an excited, overstimulated dog? Eleven months. I ask for easy things like sit and look and down, but she can't hold them for more than a few seconds. If I hold her back, back she frustration barks. Mm -hmm. uh, often when a dog is overstimulated and we focus on holding them, um, they will amp up because when we hold them back, they don't have to use their brain. They're, you're doing all the work for them, so they can just entirely focus on whatever they're excited about. Um, sit look down it, it are all really great things to do um but it's not just about doing those things it's about um finding a threshold from whatever the dog is stimulated by so that your dog can actually hold those positions um with consistency and the other thing is that if your dog holds the sit for you know three seconds and then they get up What's happening when that happens? Are you just asking them to sit again? Are you letting them pull at the end of the leash for a few seconds? Or do you shorten up on your leash and place them right back to where they were sitting and then put slack in the leash so that they have to use their own brain and their own self-control to and, maintain that sit? It. So it's not just about sitting. It's about how you how you make them sit. Is your leash loose? Is your leash tight? It should be loose. Um, where are you situated in comparison to what your dog is stimulated by what type of reinforcement do you have with you is it high value reinforcement it could even be a toy rather than food if yeah. your dog is more focused on that so i i think you're in the right direction mm -hmm. with the sit down look but um in terms of um the frustration barks try to don't hold her back but follow through get the dog back into position as quickly as you can dogs learn within one second remember and then put slack back in the leash forcing your dog to have to use their brain and you might end up putting them back a hundred bagillion times uh but if you i know you'd like that um <laughs> but if you are consistent and you're not putting the dog in a position where it's just impossible for them to be successful you will see change see change Sea change. What else are you doing with the dog? You know, are, are the only exercises you're working on sit down and look? You know, maybe uh, doing some more 
you know, engaging exercises, maybe a game of tug before you get in, you know, to take the edge off. Maybe you work on some of your leash walking and then move into the, some of the stationary exercises. Maybe that's a way to get a little bit more attention. Is there something that your dog's great at? You know, is there something that you can work on, get lots of success and then move into those, mm -hmm. um, some of the stationary exercises can just give you that edge, uh, give you the edge that you need. But Kale's uh, advice is very important that uh, you follow through with what your expectations are. From Amanda Rain. Ranart, Ranart, uh, I'm convinced. Since, uh, convinced, I'm convinced since using the McCann method that the crate is the key to an enjoyable puppy experience instead of a stressful one. Absolutely, I totally agree, and um, it is the key to to uh, getting more attention and leadership very early on. And a dog that like loves to listen, it's it's so remarkable. I saw that transformation in my situation. I re I started crating uh, an older dog, mm -hmm. and because she just wasn't listening, and yeah. I, I didn't know any better. And I it was it was a measurable change. You know, using the crate just allowed me to be the best thing in, mm -hmm. that I can re, you know, that could reinforce her. Really made, made a big difference. I like to hear that. From Jesse Christensen, um, how would you suggest I set up a crate in a, pl a playpen puppy area? Do I move the crate out of the pen for the first few nights to have the puppy sleep near me? Should I should pee pads be in or out? I'm in an apartment. Mm -hmm. So many things to unpack there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, the That's answer great. is going to be very simple. Uh, just use a crate. Do not use a playpen. Do not use pee pets unless they are absolutely your only option. It, it, you did put apartment. So in mm. some apartment situations, the pee pads can be very helpful. I would not put the pee pad anywhere near no. where and the I dog is. People it make that mistake a lot. All because it's convenient. Yeah. yeah. Um, don't put it anywhere near where the dog will be sleeping and, and playing. So because you'll end up just trust me. Don't do it because you'll you'll be working on house training issues forever. So yeah. um, it's one thing that you, maybe you could put the pee pad by the door initially, or maybe on the on your balcony. Um, I would as quickly as you can. Did it say what age the dog is at all? Um, no. Um, no. I would as quickly as you can eliminate the, the pee pads and work towards teaching the puppy to hold it to go outside. Um, I'm not a big fan of using play pens with young puppies. Uh, I think it gives them too much freedom. I yeah. think it gives them too much ability to have accidents. I think it gives them too much ability to kind of do their own thing. Um, I like to crate train first. So my crates aren't optional. You go in, the door shut, and then I do all kinds of great things to teach the puppies to love their crate. So it's their safe place it's the place that they want to go and hang out um as the puppy is no longer chewing no longer having accidents um anything like that i may then use a pen to give my puppy a little bit more freedom out of their crate uh but the puppy would have a lot of things trained underneath their belt we personally don't use a playpen because of the way our house is set up we have a very large kitchen which is great and we're able to put baby gates on mm -hmm. either side which acts like a big playpen and we are in the kitchen with our puppy yeah. at the same time yeah. um so there's always a lot of togetherness happening which is really good and when um you know the puppy needs a break or we need a break then we happily put him in the crate um and i find that that just is a lot better we're also really a couple things came to mind we're also really intentional about the moments whenever the dog the puppy is out of their yeah. crate we're intentionally exercising them we're intentionally training them we're intentionally snuggling with them we're doing we're being very intentional about it so that when we've just spent that 30 minutes or whatever the amount of time is i'm picking an arbitrary number and the puppy goes back in the crate they're like oh thank goodness mm -hmm. i'm exhausted now yeah and they'll sleep for a little bit um don't um uh you know don't resort to using a playpen you know just to let the puppy meander about and run around and bounce and be goofy uh you know be intentional about the time that your puppy's out of their crate and make sure it's with you mm -hmm. and then they'll be relaxed enough to go back into their kennel when they're done yeah the other thing specifically with your pee pad um Kale mentioned keep it away from their sleeping areas and play areas. That's mm -hmm. really important. If you're in an apartment with a balcony, put it outside on the balcony. You know, maybe they can go outside. Having a definitive yeah. line or edge to that uh, where the puppy pee pads are can make a big difference. And uh, again, and not letting them like go and use the pee pad it's whenever right, exactly, they want. Exactly. Because so, that so, will lead to problems yeah. down the road. You need to, just like the dog can't go totally, outside whenever it wants, totally. you need to look for signs that the puppy has to go to the bathroom and then you would take the puppy to the pee pad or you would take the puppy outside. You don't just leave it out for the dog to take whenever they want to. I am um, uh, uh, on a leash. You know, all of the videos that we talk, the, way, the, the methods that we teach in our videos, we happen to be able to go outside with our dogs. Um, but... 
pee pad is exactly the same thing. You're going to go over there with a leash. Mm -hmm. You're going to control the puppy's access to that thing. If they don't go, they go back in the crate for a couple of minutes with your eyes on them. Like these steps are exactly the same. You're going to treat it the same way. Um, And that's how you're going to speed up your puppy potty training. Yeah. Good questions. Um, from one, two, three. I think it's maybe your second or third time here. One, two, three. I remember uh, from one of the other super uh, train stations. I don't have a dog yet, but getting one in November, conveniently on my birthday. Do you know how I uh, can earn a dog's trust? I want to learn early so I can prepare for when the time comes. Juan, you should check out our puppy prep guide for sure. Literally, it's going to tell you everything and more things that you didn't even know you needed to know about bringing a new puppy home. And this is literally what this what this program is about: um, helping you set up your home, telling you exactly what things you need to get. We even go as far as you know, helping people you know understand how to pick puppies and yeah. how to socialize them and how to get them used to things and what to do in your first week home, all of that stuff. Um, but to give you a couple of answers right now. Um, to get your puppy to trust you, you need to be a good leader. You need to be, um, you know, you need to give good, clear information. You need to spend some time um, getting to know the puppy and, you know, hand feeding the puppy, teaching a few basic skills, um, you know, playing some tug, you know, doing things that are going to um, embellish your relationship. Um, that's what you need to focus on when you first when you first get the puppy home. But just make sure your house is well structured. You know, you have the crate, you have all the things you need to have just to make your life easier. And, and a great leader uh, sets the puppy up to be right. Doesn't yeah. doesn't say no all the time. Yeah. You, the last thing you want is to be saying, no, 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 no. If that's what's happening, you're yeah. doing things wrong. So yeah. you're setting your dog up to be successful. And your dog also understands that they can look to you for guidance because you're pleasant and cheery you're not yelling when your puppy has an accident you know you're uh, uh, you mark that moment you fix the problem and then they come back to you and everything is good again you have to uh, remember that you know uh, the the first little while it can be really challenging because there's all sorts of frustrating things that can happen yeah so um, set up your environment set up your uh, relationship the right way by setting it up for success Saul Melman asks, thoughts on Bark It Out to train a three-month-old puppy, a three-month-old puppy to learn to be alone in a dedicated play space. We don't want to cause separation anxiety. I don't know where Bark It Out came from. I, I can't imagine a world where, I mean, I maybe think, it's because people it's, don't have to do. No, I think it stems from like sleep training for babies, mm. like let them cry it out. I right. think that people often think that what you do with a baby, you should do with a dog, and that is not what happens. Yeah, I, I wonder if uh, baby, if, I mean, for dogs, barking is pretty self-rewarding. They like mm-hmm. get this little dopamine bump every time they, they, they bark. Um, I wonder if it's the same for babies. I'd be interested to find that out. Um, so there's a point where you can let them bark it out, and there's a point where you need to step in and intervene. Actually, we had a question um, exactly like this a little bit earlier um, earlier on the stream, so it's interesting, it's, it's a common common question um so you will cause separation anxiety by reacting to barking in the wrong way so most of the reason when separation anxiety is caused by humans it's because people are using their crates the wrong way so only using them when or or pens or whatever your situation is when you're leaving them or going to bed or disengaging from them a lot of people don't use the crate while they're in the room like five is in his crate all the time while I'm in the same room with him because I'm on the computer or I'm doing something else and he's not just going and doing his own thing he's in the crate so he learns to chill out he also is in a crate when I'm in the other room so that he gets comfortable with that when they're really young you can let them bark it out because they're they're puppies and they're really inexperienced at that point and sometimes they'll just sort of you know tire themselves out and they'll go to sleep and they'll lie down and then you can come in and praise them or just let them sleep and don't interrupt them uh but and i mentioned this earlier if the puppy is working itself into a tizzy and um (laughs) how does that come up twice um and starts to like just get a little bit too amped you need to address it but we don't address the barking by going in and shushing and quieting and soothing the dog that creates so the dogs learn i really want to see you and then we come in and we go oh it's okay you know i'm here that's going to create a little bit more anxiousness with your dog it's better to go in and say hey knock it off that's enough and then once they settle that's better good dog praise from there Um, and you're tapping on the crate 
Yeah, not yeah. not tapping not on your tapping husband's shoulder. <laughs> um, so well, interrupt. Yeah. So it, it, there isn't a right answer. Sometimes you let them bark it out, and sometimes you don't. It but, really just but, depends. But it's more about the crate training. It's more. Mm-hmm. It's less about the uh, responding, it, which these these are all important steps, especially when we're talking about um, separation anxiety. But also, you know, thinking about how am I going to incorporate crate training into my daily activities? I think you touched on that at the beginning. Yeah, that's going to be a crucial part, so that your dog's less likely to bark. Also, what are you doing before your dog goes in the crate? So making sure that they have, uh, they've had adequate exercise. They've had their uh, outside pee poop time. They, uh, you know, pee don't poop. they they don't need to be fed. <laughs> they have all of their needs are met, and then you can they can go into their crate using a crate for a very short period of time, many times a day in different locations in your home is a really great way to yeah. get your dog understanding that, huh? You know what? The crate's not that bad, and. You know, it's not like they're going to close me in the crate and go to sleep for the night. They're not going to close me in the crate and then go away to work for six hours or whatever the case may be. Work on crate training. Think about it, that it's training. You're working on this no different than you're working on response to name or your sit command or you're walking on leash. It's training. Yeah. Uh, Lori Billings, uh, thoughts of uh, your eight-week-old puppy sleeping in your bed at night with you? Hmm. Seems so cute I know. and so snuggly and so sno- soft and so wonderful, except it's a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a really bad idea. So we we don't usually let our um, dogs sleep in the bed with us until um, they can be trusted in the house and mm. they understand not to chew things and they understand um not to go to the bathroom or you're you know not going to just jump off the bed and do their own thing eight week old puppy shouldn't be jumping off the bed that would be you know that would be hurt hurt the puppy in such a way um the thing that's very confusing is an eight week old puppy is very apt to snuggle in and and sleep with you because they're so young yeah. but you give that puppy two or three weeks and it's going to be a whole different story. You're <laughs> right. going to be getting your nose bitten off. You're going to be getting You're bouncing around, bounce all, around all kinds yeah. of crazy stuff. So um, we recommend, though, for relationship building, um, having your puppy sleep in a crate in your room with you. So when I, we raise our new puppies, five is eight months old now. He still sleeps in a crate beside my bed, right beside my bed. Um, he sleeps there every single night because it is nice to kind of, it is nice to sleep together and have the dog close. And that way I could address him, you know, making noise if he or... did have a problem. Actually, he got me up the other night, didn't he? It was mm. like 530 in the morning and he started to whine. I thought, what is with you? And it was so unusual. I took him out. He had to poop. And I thought, what a good puppy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I wouldn't have known if he was in, a, in a, another location. Um, he, you know, so I wouldn't do it. Um, you can do it later on down the road if, if you'd like to. You also don't ever have to have the dog sleep in your bed with you. It's totally personal preference. Um, but that's a luxury. It's, yeah, it's, it's um, earned. Yeah, it's, it's earned. earned. Great question, though. Anita Staple, thank you for the super sticker. It sounds like... <laughs> um, I, I, that's a different one. I don't think I've seen that super sticker before. No. It's like a happy... Very different. Lady on it. It's like very artsy. Yeah. Iveta, um, uh, Iveta asks, four month old is struggling to walk nice on lead without food. Would a slip leash work? And I worry about other people reinforcing him uh, by jumping up, by petting him without our permission. That's a really good thing to know. He now jumps on dogs. Okay, so uh, let's break this down a little bit. There's uh, a few, let's w- we'll work on the, the uh, equipment part first. Mm-hmm. And maybe even the without food part. Okay, sure. Because four months old, that's not very old. Yeah. That's really young. Um, I-, I personally wouldn't be, uh, working towards walking my, I wouldn't be walking my four month old dog um, out around a lot of busyness at this point because four months really isn't a long time to be doing leash walking training. It usually takes a lot longer than that to get to a product where you can actually go out and on top of that, not use food. So, so with that said, there's a big difference between teaching your dog to walk on leash and taking your dog yeah. for a walk. And yes. I think you're taking your dog for a walk and, and you haven't taught it doing to walk some training yet. a little bit. Yeah. 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 Good point. Um, so it, it's important that you're. Thanks, Cal. It's important that you're teaching your dog how to walk on a loose leash, you're teaching skills, how to stop and sit at your side, how to respond to leave it, how to stay at your left-hand side when you change directions, how to stay at your left-hand side when you change speeds. These are all the things that we do with our leash walking training before we ever take our dog for a walk around the, the block. So when I'm 
leash walking my dog, um, I at four months old, I would be working, you know, in the house. I would be working in the driveway with, you know, controlled distraction so I can build on it a little bit more. Um, I would not be going around a lot of other people and dogs until I felt my, my dog was ready for that. So I think you're a little bit ahead of yourself. You're, you're putting your dog in a situation where it's really easy for them to fail, um, which is a very normal thing. So many people do this. Um, so I would go back to the drawing board and work a little bit more on teaching the skill and then start to build in the distractions a little bit more gradually so your dog can learn to, to do it well. For our 1 million subscriber puppy training Q&A, you guys asked some great questions. That so was many so, questions. It's been so much fun hanging out and uh, chatting. We're deep into overtime now. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to mention about opportunities to uh, for Puppy Essentials or for the PPG or the 40th anniversary? Or uh, like that? No, just what's cool about our Puppy Essentials or all our online programs, you can start anytime. You literally could sign up tonight and join our live class on, on Monday. Um, it, you know, they start all the time, which is great and uh, there was a, a link somewhere in the chat there uh, to learn about um, all of the offerings that we'll be doing for our 40th year anniversary. So um, if you're local, you should come and check it out. We got uh, some fun things um, in the works. And if you're not, then um, pay attention to online because there could be some things there too. Thanks for watching. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for subscribing. Thank thanks for subscribing. Thank you thank to you our for moderators for tonight. <laughs> and thank you to you for uh, making this fun and uh, you know giving us a reason to fire up the camera and make these fun videos over the course of every single week. Now, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training.